I have been wanting to take more creative journeys for about a year and a half. I am used to creating custom experiences for my clients who want to do an experience that you can't get on a bus. Or they want to know like the People Magazine version of history <laughs> instead of just the dull, dry, boring facts like dates and the place that it took place and stuff like that. They want to know what went on behind those palace walls or behind closed doors. And so I am really good at figuring all that out and finding out all kinds of interesting tidbits and history and things that make life interesting instead of just the monotone, uh, you know, voice that you get when you follow a tour guide. And so I found the dish, I found the history, all the behind the scenes, very interesting facts. I have a fabulous slideshow for you of really cool stuff about the Louvre and all the wonderful portraits that I found in the Louvre and what was typical of portraits in the days of the paintings that exist in the Louvre. What are the different styles that they use to create portraits and how did they tell stories with art and what is the history behind the Louvre and, and um, all, what's the history in Paris and all that really cool stuff. I love taking people on adventures, creative art and culture tours where you learn the history behind the painting, the history behind the architecture, and why did they create that statue, and what's all the really interesting stuff that goes on in an artist's mind before they create, and then how can you apply that to your art? Where does it become practical for you to take this concept that the masters use and turn your own stories into art? I'm also gonna be asking you to wear a hat and I can see you guys are wearing hats. You look so good. It's so much fun to dress up. And here's the thing, do you know, who can guess? I'm gonna to go to the gal review and you hold up your hands and say, who can guess why I wear hats? Hold up your hand if you think you know the answer. Okay. All right. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic, and the hairdressers aren't open. <laughs> <laughs> you, you nailed it. Wait, she nailed it. I am, we are in the middle of a pandemic and my roots, the color of my real hair goes right to here. And I do not want, I don't like <laughs> my color. <laughs> so um, I'm wearing hats and that way it covers it. Now I just have to pray that I'm going to get to a hairdresser before it goes below the the hat line. But in any case, here we are with all my hats and I have lots of hats. Okay, so Barbara got a point. Uh, so write that down because I'm not keeping track of your points. We're going to have a way for you to submit your points and why you got them and how you got them. And we're going to have a way to do that in part three, two prizes. Number one, everybody who gets a certain number of points is going to get invited to my next creative journey. Okay, you won't have to pay for it because I'm going to start charging. This was a lot of work. It's totally worth it, but it was a lot of work. And so I know I'm going to need to charge the next time, but you're going to get to come for free if you have enough points. And we're going to do the points in part three. And then the grand prize is this. I am going to give you a free pass to my three day work along workshop. And so I'm having on February 25th, 26th, and 27th, I'm having a three-day work-along workshop where you're going to learn how to draw eyes that sparkle, how to draw hair that shines, how to draw nose and mouth, how to get a likeness, how to draw the dog, the fur that's so soft you feel like you can cut the paper, how to find out what you keep doing wrong so that you can make your portraits better. And I'm going to talk about how you can create your own portraits by finding and shooting the right photos and how you turn stories into art and how to compose um, portraits of both people and pets. So if you're intimidated by portraits of people after this, you won't be because I'm going to give you a super fast system, three magic tricks that will make you get a likeness every time. And I'm going to be drawing with you. I'm going to be drawing while you watch me. And then I found out people don't really want to draw while they're watching me. They want to draw right after they watched me. So I'm going to draw for 30 minutes and you're going to draw. You're going to have access to a portal with all the stuff that's inside that workshop. 
and you're going to get a runway up to the workshop because right now I've already uploaded the dog and the videos and the downloads and the templates and all that. So you can start practicing before it even starts. Now, normally that's that three, three day workshops are going to be 997 for three days because I normally charge 397 for a one day workshop with me uh, virtually, but um, times three, I discounted a little bit to 997. But if you sign up during today at turnfamilyphotosintoart.com and I'll type, um, I'll type the URL here, you can use the discount code that says save 80% and it knocks it clear down to 80% off. And so you're gonna get that for free. The grand prize winner is gonna get that for free. The person who has the very most points, okay? So that's gonna be super exciting. You'll get to go to this thousand dollar workshop for three days and you'll be able to learn how to turn your uh, memories into masterpieces. So I'm gonna type that um, into the chat a little bit later and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna award that at the end. Okay, so that's the overview. We're gonna go tour the Louvre right now, see portraits that are inside the Louvre and then how you could turn memories into masterpieces. I'm gonna show you how a, a Parisian artist who's commanding 180,000 for her latest painting. She is, I'm gonna take you inside her studio in Paris and show you how she creates a piece of art and then I'm also going to show you how I took one of my students, one of my apprentices who made it into my inner circle on a private guided custom tour of the UK and France. And I'm going to show you how she turned her moments into masterpieces as well. So this is going to be really awesome. The slideshow is going to be incredible. And then after we do the slideshow, we're going to pause. I don't know how long it'll take, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. And then we're going to pause and we're going to take about 20 minutes of break to get a snack, do a bio break, stretch your legs. And then we're going to come back and I'm going to go into the history of the Louvre. And during that time, I'm going to be giving you some really interesting facts that I found out. And you're going to be wanting to take notes because guess what? If you guess the answers right, you're going to get points about these facts. And so that's going to be real important. And then the third session we'll break for 20 minutes in the third session we'll talk more about the history of paris the history of the louvre and we'll go ahead and give that prize and talk more about what's next okay so fasten your safety belts ladies and gentlemen we are about to take off um no smoking not uh, on the plane or in the lavatory if you smoke it's against federal regulations strap yourself in because we're boarding air france and we're about to head to Paris. We're going to land very shortly, very shortly. <laughs> so it will be a very short trip. And you don't, uh, I see that the, the, um, the creature who's in charge of Homeland Security, peanut butter, you wanna come here? <laughs> he was supposed to be in charge of Homeland Security, but I'm afraid he's in the middle of his afternoon nap. So maybe we will have him inspect all of you later to make sure that there's no bombs. But right now, fasten your safety belts, extinguish all smoking materials, and strap yourself in because we are about to head to an amazing adventure um, where you are going to learn how to create amazing memories and then turn your memories into your own masterpieces. So I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to jump into the slideshow. Okay. Here we go. Just a minute, I gotta get this, I gotta get this thing situated. It's open, but here we go. Uh -oh. Um, a Sherry uh, Blackwell, you, you need to mute yourself just so that it doesn't interfere. Everybody double check your mute button and make sure you're, you're muted. Okay, welcome to Paris. We're about to head to the Louvre 
and we're going to land in Paris in about two seconds. So you, you can unfasten your safety belt now so that you can breathe. And we're going to take an amazing tour of the Louvre. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to see Paris as well. So welcome to your first creative journey with Sandra Angelo. I went to the Louvre about, um, I think it, my last trip there, I've been there a bunch of times, but I think my last trip there might have been in 2003. And so when I went there, they had that wonderful um, pyramid, as you know. Um, you may or may not know the history of this. I'll be telling you why they put this pyramid here, but we're gonna take ourselves inside the Louvre and tour. So welcome to your first creative journey. The first thing you need to do is prepare. You get your passport out. I print my itinerary, put it in a folder. I take my, this is my carrying case for my iPad or my uh, tablet so that I can take that along with me and take notes as well. And then I lay out all of my clothes and I try them on in front of a mirror and I actually take photographs of myself in my clothes <laughs> because I wanna know how I'm gonna look in pictures. So that's how you start is by creating a memory. Now, I took this woman, Carol, to an art and culture tour that was custom designed for her. She hired me to take her to both the UK and France. And today we're gonna to be talking about France. And so when we went to France, she was um, given a, a tour of the Louvre with a cultural attache named Henri. And Henri is one of the most amazing factual person. He can take you anywhere in Paris and tell you why that doorknob was created or who created it or why that painting was there or the architecture or whatever. And so I hired him to take her in the back door through the loop so that we would not uh, miss anything and we didn't have to stand in the long lines either. Now, the cool thing was that um, the Louvre, if you went to the Louvre and you spent 30 seconds in front of every painting, there are 3,500, 35,000 paintings. They actually have 350,000, but 35,000 are on display. If you stood in front of each painting for 30 seconds, it would take you a total of three months to tour the Louvre. So we can't see everything today. So what I'm doing is just giving you highlights and I'm just focusing on portraits today. Obviously we could go back and study other things about the Louvre, but since we're gonna be doing a portrait workshop, that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Okay, so sh when she created this memory with Henri, later on she turned it into a masterpiece and I'll tell you that journey and how it happened. So I hired Henri to take us all over Paris and when you're going, to visit a museum or a gallery or um, anything, any landmark, it's really important to get familiar with the city in which that was created so that you find out the history of that particular city and why it is that that happened in that place. And so Henri took her all over the place. Now I was, um, I have been, I was raised overseas and I grew up in Africa and also Europe. And so I have a little bit different approach than most Americans do. Americans are kind of in a hurry. I bet you that today um, there are people who wanted to come, but they didn't because it was three hours because the attention span in this culture is so short and they really don't know how to dive in and savor art and savor culture. And so very typical of a US person Carol was really nervous because we were going to see the Musée d'Orsay and the Louvre in one day. And she was just really nervous that we weren't going to see it all. So she was chattering away to Henry, Henri and she was saying, I'm just so concerned. We don't really have time to stop and eat lunch. But I had gotten some croissants from breakfast and some boiled eggs and a few grapes and I had them in my bag. And I was about to hand them to Carol because she was really frustrated that she didn't, she didn't want to stop and take the time for lunch. And a typical Parisian, Henri turned to her and he said, Madame, if you will pardon me, it's very important to take time to feed yourself and to just savor life as you move through it. 
So why don't we find a place to meet the, to eat the egg? And so we, we said, okay, we're gonna find a place to eat the egg. So we did, we had a petit dejeuner, which means a small lunch on the lawn at the Louvre. And we started talking and laughing and she got to know a whole bunch about Henri himself that she would never have known if she hadn't paused to savor the journey. And we, all I had was one tiny little napkin that we laid on, the, well, it wasn't tiny, it was a pretty big napkin. We laid that on the grass and that was our tablecloth. And then I put out the eggs and I put out the um, grapes and we all had a tiny little bite just to refresh ourselves. But that little, little petit déjeuner was an amazing experience for all of us. And you can see that we had a really good time, okay? Laughing and getting to know each other. And one of the things I wanna encourage you to do as an artist is to take time to save your life. Go someplace with your kids or your grandkids. Take them to a sandbox or take them water skiing or teach them how to bake chocolate chip cookies. Or um, I taught the kids the other day how to do chocolate mud cake in a uh, microwave. And by stopping and slowing down so that you can savor your journey as you're moving through it, you can create the most amazing experiences that later you can turn into masterpieces. And coincidentally, we had just seen a painting at the Musée d'Orsay that was all about this. It was about taking time to enjoy life. It was by Claude Monet and his tablecloth was a lot bigger and they had a lot more food than we did. And they were dressed in pretty fancy clothes, but it was still a dejeuner. It was still a lunch, a picnic on the grass. And so it was kind of interesting that we had just seen the Parisians doing that. And then Henri was teaching us to do it as well. So when you're moving through a masterpiece, museums or whatever, try to find ways that you can relate it to your own life instead of just thinking, okay, that's in the history category. As soon as I'm done with this tour, I'm gonna to forget those facts. It was interesting, but it's not gonna be a part of my life. I want you today to see that I teach you how to turn your life into a masterpiece. And then once you turn your life into a masterpiece, you hold up your paper or your canvas to that masterpiece. And all of a sudden you see these beautiful reflections because art is a mirror of your life. And if you create a boring life, all you're gonna have is bowls of fruit. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, oops, I forgot to change the title. Sorry about that. Looks like I forgot to change it on a lot of them. Let me go back. Like I said, I did this really fast, so I apologize. I do have the titles here on my notes and I will tell you what they are and then I'll go back later and finish, fix this PowerPoint. Okay, so this pastel portrait, I started with this one because I love to research courageous women in art. A lot of times throughout history, women, women weren't giving a real significant role when it comes to politics or business or, or even art. They were not um, mentioned until the 1800s. Although a lot of women did contribute to a lot of the masterpieces, they didn't, they weren't even mentioned. This one is by Delatour and he created an image that would correspond to the role of this ambitious woman. He used pastels pencils and he also combined it with gouache and he evoked an air of intimacy about this woman. This was a Marquesa in her home and she was surrounded by a meaningful, familiar object. This work shows that official portraits were finally beginning to depict psychology as well as just what a person looks like. This was one of the first mistresses of King Louis XV. And she also became his counselor eventually. And this was commissioned by him to do it in pastel. And it was a really cool painting because it was one of the first times that I've seen a woman of significance and importance highlighted in a museum like this. Because in those days, women did not play heightened roles. So I started with that one because I admire courageous women. So if you want to write this down, the name of the artist, because I got I think I'm gonna get it wrong on several slides because I had to rush doing this. It took me 14 hours to put this together, but 
um, because of all the research, but I didn't get a time to go back and proofread the slides. So the title, uh, the artist that did this is called Della Turk, D-E-L-A-T-O-U-R, okay? And so that's the guy who did this. And um, this was commissioned by King Louis the 15th, okay? So now we're going on to the next one. This was also commissioned by King Louis the 15th. And whoops, oh, I, I clicked the wrong mouse. Hang on, I've got two mice here. And I have one mice, one mice has, mouse has my notes on it and the other mouse has my, um, has the, the slide clicker. Okay, so this was a portrait of King Louis the 14th in his coronation robes. And this was painted in 1701 by a painter called Hyacinth Rigold. And it was commissioned by the king because he wanted to satisfy the desire of his grandson, Philip IV, for a portrait of him. And Louis XIV kept it hanging in Versailles and it became the official portrait of Louis XIV. This portrait of the Sun King was created in 1701, like I said, and it was originally intended as a gift for Philip V of Spain, but the French court liked it so much that they never sent it to the Spanish king. Louis XIV was 63 years old when this portrait was painting. And you can see that he asked the artist to make him look pompous and, and kingly. And there's a lot of you know uh, beautiful fabrics and he's surrounded by opulent surroundings and he's dis displayed in a very kingly fashion, okay? Another kind of portrait, and by the way, that was a portrait of King Louis the 14th, okay? I'll go back and fix it on the slides later. Another common theme was military portraits because the French and the English were always trying to conquer the world. And so they were going into countries and taking them over and taking the paintings and the furniture and the jewels and things like that and capturing it. And they were both trying to create an empire. And so um, whenever there was a soldier, especially brave and could help them conquer that particular empire, they would commission a portrait of that to uh, mortalize um, this soldier. And this one happened to be a guy named, a Scotsman in Great Britain, and he was named Sir Henry Rayburn, and that is spelled R-A-E-B-U-R-N. He began as a goldsmith, and then he worked as a miniature artist, and then at the age of 20, he met David Martin, who introduced him to the great portrait artist of the, of the, oh, dang it. I clicked the wrong mouse, sorry about that. <laughs> he, he was commissioned to do this and um, he paid really um, close attention to what would signify that this man was in power, okay? And so he wanted to show him in his uniform, he wanted to show him with his sword and he wanted to show him in kind of a pompous way, okay? That was one, type of portrait that was done in this time period. Another common theme was immortalizing um, conquerors like Napoleon. So Napoleon had a very big ego. I think he was a narcissist. And um, when he was coronated, he coronated himself as the King of France. And um, the day that he was supposed to have the crown placed on his head, he grabbed the crown and placed it on his own head because that's how arrogant he was. And then he turned around and crowned Josephine who was his favorite uh, woman of the day. And you can see that there's a lot of pomp and circumstance surrounding this. And most likely the painter exaggerated because this is what we now call in politics, we call this spinning the story. It's like, you know, they only tell the parts of the story that they want the public to know. And they also try to exaggerate their military achievements and their loyalty and all the heroic acts that they did. And so Napoleon was no different than our current leaders in the sense that they're always trying to look amazing. 
So that is a typical painting that you will see in the Louvre. This one is a pretty large one. Then you can also go into beautiful rooms in the um, Louvre where you will see the quarters that the kings used to live in. When the Louvre was first built, it was built as a fortress with thick walls to protect Paris because like I said, there was a lot of people trying to conquer uh, France. And so they were trying to create a fortress to protect them, uh, their, their wonderful things from being stolen. And they were trying to protect the walls of the city so that they couldn't be conquered by the English who were, who were after them. And then later on, it was, um, they built palaces um, right around where the Louvre was, and they turned it into a residence for the kings until later on the kings moved to Versailles. So you can see absolutely opulent quarters that the um, kings and queens lived in and where they hosted their, um, their guests to try to impress them. This one is called the Apollo Gallery. I believe this one's on the first floor. And then, of course, the most famous painting that you'll ever see in the um, art museum is the Mona Lisa. And there's just hordes of people around it. It's actually a really tiny painting. And even though it's a nice painting that um, he did, it's not as impressive to me as some of the other paintings, especially the one directly across the room from this. And so um, when you go to the Mona Lisa, this is what you're gonna see, crowds as far as the eye can see. And it's actually behind bulletproof glass and it's just a tiny little painting so you can really barely see it. So the Mona Lisa became famous because when it was hanging in the Louvre, um, it, by the way, first of all, it hung in Napoleon's bedroom because he stole it when he conquered a place in Italy. And so it hung in his bedroom. And then coincidentally, the only other time that it was hung was when it was hung in the United States. Jacqueline Kennedy um, arranged for it to come and tour the US. And so that was the second time that it was hung. But um, it hung in Napoleon's bedroom until finally they um, made the Louvre a public place where everybody could go. And so, that when it became a public museum, when in the 1700s, when it became a public museum, one of the guards who was from Italy stole the Mona Lisa and he cut it right out of its frame and he had two fellow conspirators and he just, you know, uh, rolled it up and stuck it underneath his coat and walked out the front door. And so it was, it wasn't noticed. I think it was like 23 hours before they noticed that it was missing. And it became a really big thing. They, it was, you know, like the big news. Um, they didn't have Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram, but uh, I think news got around nonetheless. And that's why the Mona Lisa became so famous is because it got stolen. And so that was a very big deal. And then when they finally captured it back two years later, he tried to sell it to someone in Italy, an art um, dealer in Italy, because he felt that the Italians should have it back because that's who it belonged to. And um, he was he was um, captured and so was the Mona Lisa and it was rehung. And because there was so much publicity for those two years, that's how she became super famous. Okay, but a much more interesting painting is right across the, um, the gallery, right across from the Louvre. And this one is called um, the, the Miracle at Cana. And if you're familiar with the Bible, um, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. He was at a wedding and his mother came up to him and said, You've run, they've run out of wine. Can you do something about it? And he said, my time hasn't come. And she said, well, they need wine. And so he went ahead and turned the water into wine. And when they took the wine to the, the person who was in charge of the party, the guy said, oh my gosh, this wine is so much better than what we served before, because usually they would serve the good wine first, and then everybody was a little drunk, so they could serve wine that wasn't so great. But Jesus turned water into amazing wine, and so this was a painting about it. And this one was commissioned to be done for a monastery back in Italy. Again, a lot of the paintings that you see in the Louvre actually have been stolen. 
And they have been a result of plundering when the different people conquer different parts of the world. And so, um, so this one is really interesting. And I wanna tell you a few things that I noticed about it because I was much more personally sat, um, interested in this painting than I was in the Mona Lisa, apart from the fact of the interesting story. So when you get up close, you can see all these little subplots going on. And I am fascinated with critters. So I was pretty interested that there were a lot of dogs in this painting. Here's one over here. And you'll notice a theme in my tour of, of Paris is that I'm always looking for the animals. And you'll notice over here, there's a little dwarf that's um, got a bird on his hand. And you'll notice that there's people serving and talking. And it's kind of interesting to see how the people dress in those days. So zeroing in on you know, little subtopics of what's going on can tell you a lot about the story that the artist was depicting. And by the way, this is the very largest painting in the Louvre. I'll give you the dimensions later. But you can see there's a nod to the Last Supper. Remember how Leonardo da Vinci put Jesus in the middle and then people on either side. There's a nod to the Last Supper here in this painting as well. And again, if you didn't take time to really study the painting, you wouldn't notice things like that. And so I highly recommend that you take a little time and linger in front of paintings instead of that 30 seconds per painting and trying to see them all in three months. It's better to know a lot about a little and something that is significant to you. So um, I also, as you know, love animals. And so when I was at the Louvre, I took a close up shot of these animals because I thought it was just fascinating that they would allow animals at a wedding. And I thought that was kind of cool. And then of course they've got the musicians here and you can again see Jesus in the background right in the middle of the table. And then the next painting that we saw in the Louvre was a self-portrait by a master who began to focus on animals. And now this self-portrait is pretty unusual. I'm trying to pick out portraits that are different from just mugshots because there are a lot of mugshots in the, the Louvre. I mean, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are some. And they're just pictures of what that person's face looked like. Maybe they couldn't afford to have a fancy scene put behind them. But um, in this instance, this is actually a self-portrait of an artist. And this artist decided that he wanted to focus on um, drawing animals. And so he decided that he would start drawing, uh, pa painting animals that the um, kings hunt because hunting is a sport of kings. They love to go out and shoot animals and bring them back and have the servants cook them up for a banquet. And so this artist kind of start, started to focus on that. His name is Francois Desportes. Oops, wrong mouse. <laughs> okay, and then there are some paintings that are not of that particular period. This one is from 1654. And 1654 was kind of the era of the Dutch masters. They were super strong realists. If we were studying still life, we would absolutely be focusing on the Dutch masters because they really loved still life. And um, at the time, the um, tube hadn't been invented, so they were always painting indoors. And so the light that they had indoors was very unique, and that determined a certain kind of palette. And then when you see them doing a portrait of a family here, in my opinion, this is very austere. You know, it's not nearly as pompous or as bodacious as the um, royalty in the old, in the next century. Um, they weren't as much what I would call show offs. Um, they were more modest and more what I would consider more Puritan. And you can see that the environment was also that way as well. And when I was reading up on this one, um, it's by Adrian Van Ostade. When I was reading up on this, they said that actually there weren't that many family members in this family. They just had him put extra people in there. And I don't know if that was a sign of prestige or whatever, but I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the piece of art that's at the front of the museum is pretty interesting. When I first saw this, 
I just thought, oh my gosh, they're going to ruin the Louvre and they're going to ruin classical painting by going all modern. I, I've seen that happen on the, the Hyatt right across the street from me. It was so beautiful. You thought you were in Europe when you walked in there. They had hand-painted murals that were 20 feet tall and just beautiful architecture and all that. And they've ruined it. They've gone in there and made everything really austere and plain and, in my opinion, ugly. And so I was worried that um, they were going to do the same to the Louvre when I saw this. But when I saw the history behind why they did this, I thought it was pretty fascinating because this was um, done by an American Chinese artist, and, um, which is surprising to me that they would give that commission to an American. And it was an homage to the pyramids in Egypt. And um, the pyramids in Giza were reflecting what um, this guy, this um, famous architect was reflecting what he had experienced when he went to see the pyramids in Giza. So I loved it that it wasn't just a random thought. It was something that was immortalizing history and art because I actually went to Egypt when I was about, I think I may have been, I've been there a couple of times, but I think I was nine years old the first time I went there. And um, we went inside the pyramids. In those days, you could. I don't think you can go in there anymore. But we had to have a guide because it was very, it was a labyrinth. And it was really hard to find your way out. So um, you really needed a guide to show you through it. And so I like that he was giving an homage to Egyptian art, even though it's not my taste. I still liked it that he was still being artistic in a, um, a thoughtful way that was incorporating some of the art that's actually in the Louvre because they do have Egyptian art in the Louvre. And then I couldn't resist showing myself. This is me, the little blonde down here. And that's my sister, Sharon, when we were um, touring Egypt. And I think I was about nine years old when we were doing that. And so it means even more to me when I see that entrance at the front of the Louvre because it's an homage. I'm going to go back and show you this. If this is an homage to the pyramids that I had visited. So when I climbed through this entrance, it meant more to me than it would to maybe even some other people who haven't been to Egypt. And the reason that the, uh, the prime minister commissioned somebody to do this was because they were getting so many visitors that they needed a proper entrance and exit. And so this is actually an entrance and an exit for the museum when you go there so that they don't have such crowded you know, people inside the tiny little spaces in the museum. And so it was a really very clever way to handle that. So after I researched the history, it made me appreciate and evaluate the art and not just dismiss it, you know, just because maybe it's not my taste doesn't mean it's not quality art. It's good to know why artists are motivated to do what they do. And then another artist who is very influenced by, um, by art that is in the Louvre is an artist named Anne James Massey, who has become a best friend of mine um, since I met her probably 25 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago. I don't know for sure how long it's been, but it's been a long time, a couple decades at least. And she fell madly in love with all the Vermeers. And she made it her mission to go all over the world and see everything that was ever created by Vermeer. And so she actually ended up moving to Paris. She went to Paris with her aunt on a tour when she was 19 and she fell in love with a Parisian. And so she actually went back and she is still with that Parisian at this age, uh, 20, 30 years later. And they together have gone all over the world to visit all the Vermeers. This is called The Lace Maker by Vermeer. And um, he's showing kind of a, a ordinary life. You know, a lot of artists were commissioned to do um, mainly portraits of kings and, and important people and military heroes and architecture and scenes and um, historical stories and things like that. There wasn't that, it wasn't that common to see artists painting ordinary people. But Vermeer did do that. And 
the light and the quality and his technique that he used is actually what Anne Massey uses when she creates her art. And I'm actually gonna take you inside her studio so you can see the art that she's created and how she used Vermeer's techniques in today's history to create masterpieces herself. By studying what the masters did, getting inspired by looking at their work and then employing that in your own art, it can dramatically in influence the quality of your art. So this is my famous um, friend, Anne James Massey. She lives in Paris. And here we are at Shakespeare and Company, which is um, an English speaking bookstore um, where you can go and buy books in English. And Anne uh, and I became friends when I first interviewed her for the Artist Magazine. I was um, writing, I'm a, I've been a magazine columnist for 31 years and I was writing for the Artist Magazine and American Artist and Art Materials Today I had my own column in Mark's, Michael's Arts and Craft Magazine. So I got to meet a lot of amazing people. And when I met her, I actually ended up hiring her to teach a workshop at my 11 annual symposiums. I had 55 workshops with all the top masters, all these masters that I've been interviewing, I wanted them to come to San Diego and teach their techniques. And that's why my Color Pencil College and my Pencil Drawing College has so much amazing, masterful stuff is because I hired all these people who really know how to create amazing art and they came to San Diego and taught their techniques. And today I've put all those techniques into workshop. So that's when I first met Man and met Anne and we became really close friends for a variety of reasons, which I won't tell. <laughs> it's a secret. Okay, so when I was in Paris, I met up with Anne and I took her, I was actually there because um, Anthony Robbins had hired me to go to Venice, Italy to teach his Platinum Club how to paint on the Grand Canal. And on the way home, I thought, well, I'm gonna stop in Paris and see Anne. And so Anne took me to places that had inspired her art and this was one of the um, fountains that's inside the garden, the Luxembourg Garden, which is just gorgeous. If you ever get a chance to go there, I would highly recommend it. It's absolutely opulent. I mean, everything in Paris is so beautiful. It's just one of the most fun places to visit because everywhere you look, there's sculpture and architecture and, and um, fabulous art and gardens. And they really care about beauty. So she took me to a garden that inspired a painting that she had done of Henri. And you can see that she put Henri in front of this scene where I had stood. And then she pretended that there was a little boy um, poking, uh, peeking over his shoulder while he was painting. Now, Henri is not a painter, but he loves a painter. He loves Anne Massey. And so he will show up frequently in her paintings. And um, that's really common for those of us who are masters is that when you look at our paintings, a lot of times they will be filled with our family and our friends and all the people that are around us, the people that are available to model. It, as you know, I include Becky in tons of my paintings and I include Michael and JJ and Dave and all the people in my family. So this is an example of where Anne was inspired by her surroundings and she turned it into a masterpiece. And then I wanted to point out that it can be really fun to go visit the places that the masters um, were inspired. And so here's an example of the corner where Gustave Courbet um, painted this painting of uh, Parisians in the rain. And it's just really fun to go visit the places where the art was birthed and it, I find it really fun to take pictures of myself in those environments and then come home and interpret it in the way that it would apply to my life. And so I got a chance to um, interview Anne for some videos in her studio in Paris and my uh, client, my uh, apprentice in my atelier who hired me to do an art and culture journey for her, she got to go into the studio and meet Anne and she got to watch Anne's technique as Anne was creating this amazing painting called The Blessing of the Animals. And the thing that's so cool about this is when I was doing the research yesterday to find out what's going on with this painting, 
it she had been working on it i think for three years when i when i saw it and now it is available for sale and i'll show you in a minute um uh, more about that but let's look a little bit more about her painting so we got to see her actually working on the painting and talk to her about all the different techniques and you can see that she gets so detailed that she actually looks through a jeweler's I don't even know what this is called, but they put like a magnifying thing over their face so that they can see the all the little tiny details in their painting. And um, you can see she uses very tiny little brushes as well. And so she showed us a whole bunch of stuff about the painting and what inspired her. She showed us that she had used in a, a photo of this little dog to put the dog at the altar and this is a, a tradition that the Catholics have where they will, once a year, they will bring their animals to the priest and the priest will bless their animals to give them health and, and keep them well and stuff like that. And so she was showing us the photographs that she was using and the blessing of the animals. And you can see she was using this little boy um, who was a neighbor boy and she was using Henri, there he is again. And um, she used other people that she knows that live around her to inspire her as well. And you can see, she, these are all the photographs of the church where she goes to church. And she was using her church for the scenes in blessing of the animals. So it was really fun for Carol to be able to meet a world famous master in her atelier in Paris, France, and then get to get to see a piece of art that was in the works was even more exciting. And so, here's my mouse. Now the painting of the animals is over. The blessing of the animals is over. You can see Henri there again, as usual, he shows up a lot in, in her paintings. And it took her four years to, to do the painting, partly because it's so detailed. I know some of you in my courses have said, I'm so slow. Well, guess what? All creative masters, that are realists are slow. It took Michelangelo four years to paint the Sistine Chapel, and it takes a long time to paint anything that's super detailed. Part of the reason is she did damage her arm, and for about six months, her hand was out of commission, so she couldn't continue to paint. But anyway, this is a really exciting kind of exclamation point at the end of this story, and that is this. This painting is now available for sale, and it is $180,000. And so those of you who think that realists aren't popular anymore, they are. This actually is on an exhibit right now here in the United States. I think it's in Maine or someplace like that. And um, it's, it's hanging in an exhibit that's going on right now. Unfortunately, because of COVID, they have closed the museum so you can't see it in person, but you can see it online. And so it's just really fun that we got an opportunity to be a part of the history of that painting and to see it come to life and also to go visit the places that inspired the painting. It just makes it much more meaningful to you if you can find out why and what and how and who is involved in all of those paintings. It gives the art a lot more meaning. And then of course, if you are in a beautiful city like Paris, you wanna to go tour the local sites too, and you wanna create your own memories. And as an artist, you will view things differently than another person would. Even if you're in my course, you would view the world differently than I do because your story is different and what you relate to is different. And so I went ahead and went to the Notre Dame and um, then we went over to the Louvre uh, over to the Eiffel Tower. And while we were at the Eiffel Tower, you can see that Anne was taking pictures of individual flowers, which she'll probably end up using in one of her paintings. But I'm not a big fan of drawing flowers per se. And so <clears throat> you can see Anne is very different. <laughs> She's very proper. And she wore a suit, a black suit with matching pants and um, matching shoes and all that kind of stuff. She's very, very prim and very proper and very old school. And you look at me, I'm laying on the ground <laughs> taking, <laughs> taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower from a different angle than Anne would because I'm goofy, <laughs> you know, and I am uh, willing to be dramatic 
And this is the picture that I took when I laid on the ground of the Eiffel Tower. And so uh, as a photographer, I will often sacrifice my body to get the shot that I want. And I was so inspired on this tour that I might actually turn this into a masterpiece, even though I'm not a huge fan of drawing flowers, just because it has so much meaning to me, it might end up in one of my masterpieces. And then when you're staying in town and wandering around the streets, I recommend that you start taking pictures of what goes on in that neighborhood. She has a really tiny little apartment, so I couldn't stay with her, but she found a place for me in the Latin Quarter that was very reasonable. And they had this really cool little flower shop. And they also had a um, patastri shop where I used to get chocolate croissants every morning. And I would always pass this flower shop when I went um, on my way to um, meet her in the mornings. And so I decided to start playing around with the picture with my colored pencils and my oil pastels to see if I could turn that into a masterpiece. I'm not done with it yet, but it's fun to wander around the neighborhood and see what they live like. So some of you may recognize this if you've had my course in colored pencil called Mademoiselle Gigi. Then you know that um, I took this picture in a Parisian pet shop and I thought she just looked so elegant. And so I brought it back to the United States. And as you know, a lot of my work is work for workshops. So I don't do a lot of paintings to sell or completely finished com compositions and things like that. I do little vignettes to teach people how to uh, create with colored pencils. So I turned this into a workshop and a video on how to draw a fluffy kitten and how to draw the eyes that glow and stuff like that. And so you can see that by wandering around my neighborhood in Paris, I was able to get something that really inspired me. And the way that that manifests itself in my life is as a workshop, you know, because that's the kind of art that I create. For you, it might be completely different. As you saw, when Anne was photographing flowers, she was in a button down suit, very proper, one little flower. And I've got my sweater off laying beside me, laying on the ground, shooting up at the Eiffel Tower because I don't want an ordinary shot of the Eiffel Tower. And we're just different in the way that we approach life. And you will be different, too. So everywhere we went, she took me to all these significant landmarks. And every time <laughs> when I was at a landmark, I would kind of ignore the landmark and pay attention to the animals because I love animals. And so um, uh, this was at Voltaire, who is a very famous writer. And this is the house where he used to live. And you can see that I'm pointing my camera down here. And then she took this picture of me shooting dogs. She says, I take you to all these fancy places and you don't take pictures of the fancy places. You just take pictures of the dogs and cats. And sure enough, we went to another place and there was a cat. I don't get to take pictures of cats very often because they don't usually come out in public. But I will often use these dogs and cats in workshops that I teach because while I'm drawing them, it rewinds my happy memories. And then I can turn those memories into workshops. And so you can see, we went to this little restaurant. There was a dog out front. And so of course that was what was capturing my interest. And this was a particular interest to me because one of my students um, who studied with me she, she's been traveling the world and she said, Sandra, can I bring you back pictures? And I said, bring me back pictures of dogs and cats. So she took this in a window, uh, a shop window in Paris. And I thought this was a really cool shot. It's definitely something that I would probably draw. So I was influencing my students. Now, if you know me pretty well, you might know that I tend to wear different colored shoes on each foot. And so for me to take a self portrait, it makes a lot of sense to point my camera down at my feet. And I did that at point neuf, which is the, the it means point one, okay? And it's right in front of the Notre Dame and the city of Paris is stretched out on a very specific grid. And this is the first point in that grid. And so this was a significant self-portrait for me because it was showing something that's typical of me, which is different colored shoes. 
at Point Neuf in Paris. And so it would be a portrait that would talk about me. And I would rather take a portrait that talks about me than just a picture of my face because everybody knows what my face looks like, but I'd rather do something more creative. And so again, I'm a little different <laughs> than Anne and you're a little different than me. So my student that came with me um, here in the United States, she'd been studying with me in my atelier. She'd been invited to my atelier to a, do an apprenticeship with me. And when she was doing an apprenticeship, she was a really bad, she was a stick figure artist. She could not draw to save her life. She's a mathematician from Stanford and she had no training in art at all. An absolutely brilliant woman, but she didn't know how to draw. And so when I started teaching her how to draw, she wanted to explore other possibilities and she fell in love with Monet. She loved this painting of his. So we started doing what I teach in the atelier, which is turning your own life into art. And so I said, why don't you grab your granddaughter and go ahead and pose that scene and then turn it into a masterpiece the way Monet did. And so before we even went to Paris, she started getting excited and um, she started learning a lot about Monet because I teach a lot of history in the advanced programs as well. So they can see how to incorporate inspiration from history into their own art. And so she had already started becoming fascinated with Monet, which is why she hired me to take her to France because we went to Giverny Monet's garden. So I took her to the Louvre and as I say, I hired Henri <clears throat> as the, her cultural attache and she fell madly in love with Henri. She knew he's, you know, got a girlfriend and so, and she was married too, but she fell madly in love with the person. He's just an amazing human being. One of the most gentlemanly and well-educated and cultural human that you will ever meet. And he gave her such a good tour that she just, you know, wanted to, she was very inspired by him. And so she decided that she wanted to draw him. So we got some pictures of um, Henri from Anne and she went ahead and started drawing Henri's face. And then later on, she decided that she would draw Henri and herself in the Louvre. And she'd done a lot of artwork by now. She was on about her, about her fifth year with me in the atelier. And so she'd become pretty accomplished. I should have in included her beginning art because it was very stick figure-ish. So you would see the dramatic transformation that she took. But anyway, she was so inspired that she decided that her work could hang in the Louvre too. And so you can see that she decided to draw a picture of her portrait of Henri and her portrait of her granddaughter on either side of the Mona Lisa. So I thought that was kind of fun and a little bit cheeky, you know, and I thought it was so cool. It was such a great way for her to relive that amazing art and culture tour that we took with Henri. And she's been staying in touch with Anne and Henri over the years, you know, and she's on their newsletter to get updates and things like that. And she's actually purchased some of Anne's art as well. And it's just fun to get involved in art, not just learn how to draw a nose or a mouth or, a, or whiskers or whatever, but jump into art full in the deep end and satur saturate yourself in the master's work so that you can become like a master in your own version of it. And then it's fun to visit the paintings that you admire. So you can see that we went, this was actually at the Musée d'Orsay, um, which we went to just before the Louvre. And she got to see the original paintings as well when we went to the Musée d'Orsay. And so it's just really fun to get involved in art, not to just sit there and try to draw a dog for your granddaughter or whatever, but go find out how the masters painted dogs. Go to Paris and see the meet the dogs of Paris, or go to the, you know, go to the pet shop in the Latin Quarter like I did. And, you'll be inspired to draw something like Mademoiselle Gigi. So you can see these are some preliminary pieces that she did when she was sketching. I always teach people to do vignettes and work out the composition before they actually start turning their memories into masterpieces. So don't think 
that that piece that you just saw was just whipped out. It probably took her, I'm going to say half a year to work out all the different pieces of that and decide on the composition and the perspective and all of that. And you can see, it's also fun just to take pictures of your play yourself in landmark next to landmarks as well. So here's Carol today in her studio. And you can see that she has started turning her own family photos into art. And she started to get really inspired by the masterpieces that she saw in, in Europe. And you can see recently at a family reunion, this was a little boy and a little girl who are cousins. And they only see each other once a year at the family reunion. But rather than just drawing an ordinary portrait, she actually did a creative portrait because she was so inspired by the masters that we saw. We actually saw this master in Laguna Beach who includes maps in her work. And so she put the, the cousins um, snuggling next to each other on the map of the city where their reunion is every year. And so you can see that somebody who wasn't even creative when she started can end up creating her own masterpieces and she can turn that camera on her own life because she's inspired by what she saw with the masters so she can turn her own moments into masterpieces. Okay, so that's the end of our show. I'll jump back in now and check in with all of you. Okay, so how many of you were inspired by that trip to Paris? Raise your hand. Um, I'm gonna unmute a couple of you and ask you which painting was your favorite? Judith, you wanna unmute yourself? Judith M, Judy M, you wanna unmute yourself and tell me which one was your favorite? I definitely like the one with Jesus and those in it. It's beautiful, just gorgeous. The wedding of Cana. Yes. With all those people. And it is the largest painting in the Louvre and it has so much significance in it. It alludes to a lot of different things. If you, you could study that for hours and learn so much about what's, uh, what's going on there. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yes. Okay, um, anybody else have a favorite? Raise your hand. Yes, um, Nick. Um, I like that that Dutch um, the Dutch family uh, the family portrait. It just had. I mean, it, like you could feel those dark rooms where it's just candlelight and, in a sense, also the austerity of of the. Um, the, the religious order of it, you know, the, the no opulence we, we live every day, um, you know, for God and, uh, and, and count our blessings. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very fascinating interpretation. I like that. That's really good. And I, I've lived in a mud hut and I've lived in a palace and the only difference between those two is the people that are in it. Uh, as to whether or not you have joy and you nailed it on the head that the joy is evident there that even without all that pompous stuff around them they were really enjoying each other as people so good point thank you for sharing that okay let's see if anybody else has a comment okay barbara i know you've got makeup on today so we need to spot oh her. yes well i i really love the picture of canaan with, with Jesus Christ at the table, mm -hmm. but that uh, Judy took it over. So I, the, my second choice was the blessing of the animals mm -hmm. in the church as well. That was very, very touching. And that, that she really inspired me that, uh, Anne Macy, mm -hmm. that was wonderful painting for four years. It took her. Wow. Mm -hmm. She's also a colored pencil artist, and I'll show you at another time when we're in our portrait um, work along workshop, I'm going to show you some more about her as well. 
And um, she's done a lot of black and white work with colored pencils, which is fascinating. Yeah. But she's such a master and, and she's just the nicest human being too. So I'm with you. I love that one too. I like the sentiment. In I it. Do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So inspiring. Anybody Very. else have a favorite? Raise your hand if you do. Lonnie, go ahead and unmute yourself. It's just a quickie, but um, again, the blessings of the animals, you know, um, and in part because I found a husky in there that looks just like mine. <laughs> but but I love, I just love that. I, I, when you're taking pictures of animals, you know, that just so reminds me of me. So um, I'm right there with you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. a two, two animal lovers in this room, right? <laughs> you, yeah. I, I really respond to animals and I'm, I think the reason that I do is because I grew up in the jungle with a lot of animals and I like the fact that they're just, they are who they are and they don't put on airs, you know, they don't have to put on makeup or fancy clothes or try to impress you, they just are who they are and I like that authenticity. So thank you for sharing that. It's fun to find an animal that looks just like yours, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, who else has a, uh, something that inspired them? Kathy, you wanna unmute yourself? I like the Vermeer, but I always liked um, that artist anyway, because that artist does all of this candid artwork, you know, where it um, shows what's going on around and, and to see that lace maker and uh, what she was doing. I just, you know, rather than just that headshot, but that's, that's what animal make, uh, makes a good picture with the animals too, not just the ones that sit perfectly. It's the ones that are getting into trouble and pulling the tablecloth off or whatever. But That's awesome. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. I, I love Vimeo too. I really, um, I really liked the, um, the, um, the fact that he was focusing on ordinary people. You know, it wasn't just a fancy general or a king or whatever. He was doing, um, focusing on ordinary people. And so that was really cool. Okay, so what we're gonna do, oh, we have another one. Linda Bartels, you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, the blessing of the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed looking at her working with such a tiny brush mm -hmm. because at times when I'm doing a drawing, I will use a mechanical pencil mm -hmm. to get the teeny tiny lines mm -hmm. that I I need sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that just interested me that she was using that tiny brush for some of her work. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's very detailed and that's why it takes so long. Everybody who is detailed really takes a long time. So thank you for sharing that, Linda. That's awesome. And um, those who um, feel guilty about being slow, I just wanna remind you that um, the joy is in the journey. You know, I mean, nobody rushes a hot fudge sundae. I mean, the joy is the process. It's like with, a, I just finished a book and I'm really missing the characters, you know, in that book because I really enjoyed that journey with them. And enjoying the journey of creating the art is a really important thing. And it's one of the reasons that we do art is to calm ourselves down and help ourselves relax and get rid of anxiety and stress. And we know that 86% um, of all illness is stress related. And so if we can find something that takes away that stress and replaces it with, <sighs> deep breathing and siphoning off all that anxiety, it's a really good good way, a gift to give to yourself. So let me just take one more quick um, favorite and then we'll go Sandra from the UK, Dr. Holland. 
You want to unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, I like Vermeer, but I think because when you put the first Vermeer up, which I've seen it before when I've been to the Louvre, it just somehow hits me and it hits me very hard. And I can't explain um, other than whatever work he does, there is an instant story that comes across. Even with the lace maker, you, you can't just look at it and think, oh, that's lace maker. Mm -hmm. There's a whole emotional wave that comes out of his pictures. And I'm not quite sure how he achieves it in such a more stunning way than other people. And it may be that in some ways there's a simplicity about his pictures too. You know, I love the blessing of the animals. I mean, I'd die to have that on the wall here if it was uh, not too big. Um, and I liked the um, Magic Cane, and I, I think they're absolutely brilliant, but it would take me several years, I think, to go through the picture, just mm -hmm. to know the picture in the first place, other than a mass. And I think that's why I like Vermeer. I think it's clearer for me. But then I like doing detail when I paint and I love animals. So mm -hmm. it's a choice. It's a choice. <laughs> so well said, um, Dr. Holland. I, I love the way you uh, pointed out that he tells stories. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you today is that art is not just about marks on paper. It's about creating your own story and then holding up a canvas or a piece of paper to that and spilling that story into your art. And you look like a story today. You've got a fascinator on, you know, which is the what they wear as oh, in the UK. <laughs> you look so fancy. I feel like I was- I did, but I bought it to go to the races at ah. um, the Grand National it was, and which I hadn't been to the races before, but I was told by my friends to buy a accumulator, which you buy four horses. And if you win on the first, it goes on the second and so on. And I decided I wouldn't do that. So mm. I put a pound on each of my choices. And the first one didn't come in. And the second, third, fourth and fifth horse came home first. So I went home a very happy bunny <laughs> with <Yeah>. my hat. <laughs> That, that's a good luck hat, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> look, you look like a painting. You look like a Marie Cassatt painting today. And I <laughs> thank you for dressing up and, you know, coming to this event in a beautiful manner. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. I love what you had to say. So thank mm -hmm. you. She's, um, she's, by the way, Dr. Holland is in the UK and uh, in Wales, right? In Wales, yes. Uh -huh. In the midst of the COVID, we're all locked up. <laughs> Look, at, we can be together. It doesn't matter, does it? It's so awesome. Yep. You can well, be I, don't, I just don't know. You know, I can't think that I've been in lockdown as long as I have. But that's partly due to the fact that you open the doors for me, really, into art. And um, I've been obsessed by it since. <laughs> yeah. So... I remember you saying do at least 30 minutes a day. Well, how about 30 minutes a day off? <laughs> That's all. I do hours and hours of it. Love it. Do all sorts of things. I kind of I kind of sneaked you into it by saying 30 minutes, because anybody will give it 30 minutes. And then once you do 30 minutes, all of a sudden you find that the clock is fast forwarded for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so glad that you were able to use art as, to turn your lockdown into a luxury. Oh, it's, it's just been brilliant. And I I must be honest, I kind of resent it sometimes when people phone me up for a long phone call <laughs> with a picture. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> come to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've turned into her happy hermits. <laughs> yeah, very happy hermits. Yeah, that's great. 
Thank you so yeah. much for sharing. I'm so glad you could be with us all the way from Wales. Yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah. I like midnight. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go back and talk about what we're going to do next. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the spotlight. All right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to take a break. This just took a lot longer than I thought it would. It's actually been an hour and a half. So I think we'll take a um, 15 minute break rather than 20. Actually, we'll just get back here a quarter of, okay? So that's a little bit less than, uh, than 20 minutes. And so you can take a stretch, go get something to eat, get a, something to drink or whatever. And when we come back, I'm gonna show you some more really interesting facts about Paris and the Louvre. And then we're gonna give you an opportunity to earn more points so that um, those of you who earn enough points can come for free to the next one of these. And then um, one person is gonna win a free pass to the live event in Turn Family Photos into Art. Let me just talk about that really quick and put the, I promised I would put the thing in the chat. So the thing in the chat is gonna be um, the um, link that you would take HTTPWW. Turn family photos into art. Ooh, an okay, so it's turn family photos into art.com. And you um, today, if you sign up today, you get a use a discount code. I'm going to type it's S A V all capitals, eight zero, and then you spell out percent in lowercase, and that will save you eighty percent. And we're going to have more of this kind of thing in our um, in our live event. We're going to do some more history exploring so that you can learn how to fold. Um, history, historical master's methods into your own portrait making and how to turn your own stories into art. We're going to have a whole section inside that um, three-day workshop on very similar to this, um, where we're going to explore history and we're going to see how other people have turned their stuff into art, have turned their moments into masterpieces. So we're going to come back at quarter of... Um, uh, it's it's going to be quarter to to four in California, um, but whatever wherever you live, it's quarter to something, <laughs> you know. So it's 15 minutes before the hour is when we're going to be coming back. So if you want to mute yourself, I um I don't know if I muted everybody. I'll just mute everybody just in case. Um, but you um if you want to turn your camera off, you can. You know, some people like to turn their camera off during this, but be sure to turn it back on because if you don't have your camera on, you won't get points when you come back. And, and I just want to remind you why I want your camera on and why I asked you to get dressed up today, you know, because first of all, we need to get out of our pajamas, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've been sitting down around kind of slouchy because I don't need to get dressed up. I, would, I wore makeup today because Barbara said she was going to wear makeup. So I wore makeup you know, and I put on a nice little hat and you put on a hat. And I see some of you got a little dressed up because you have somewhere to go. And um, we don't need to wait until they give us permission to go out to go out. You know, we can go out together to Paris like we just did. And we can get dressed up for the tour, you know, and we can have a wonderful time together. And we can live in an imaginary world instead of living in the world that's a little scary. And so if you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, he did the books called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and they would crawl through that wardrobe into Narnia to disappear from the world and go to a better place. And so I just want to encourage you um, to, to have your camera on so we can see you. We know what you look like. We know who you are. You can interact with other people, even if you're shy. And um, just remind you that when you're not on camera, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing somebody that's like this. So I just encourage you to uh, go ahead and turn your camera on. You can turn it off right now if you want to during the break and we're gonna be back at quarter of, and then we're gonna learn more about the Louvre and more about Paris when we come back. 
And then we're gonna talk about the contest and how you can win points. Okay, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'm gonna mute myself and I'll see you guys at quarter of.